In the dark, everything is invisible. Darkness can hide illegal activities, even horrific ones, that can be local, national, or global in scale. But a beam of light creates visibility. Now you can see exactly where I am, and you can see exactly what I'm doing. It creates transparency, and it holds me accountable. So I better get on with my TED talk. <laughs> that same transparency can expose activities in our world that undermine the fabric of our society. And the first step in solving those problems is our ability to see them. Transparency can also help us save our oceans. The challenge we have with our oceans is they're so vast. You know, they cover 70% of our planet, and that makes them prone to abuses. Abuses like overfishing, illegal fishing, even modern-day slavery. What if we could shine a light on our oceans in the same way that you're shining a light on me right now, in a way that could allow us to see what's happening in our oceans? Just think of the problems we could solve. If we could see how many people were out there fishing, maybe we could solve overfishing. It's really important that we address these abuses because as world population grows, we're going to need more and more food. And we know that ocean fish can actually provide a billion people with a seafood meal every day, but only if we don't have fisheries collapse. And what we're seeing now is that there aren't enough resources to enforce science-based policies, and that's leading to a problem of illegal fishing. Illegal fishing is a billion-dollar problem. About 20% of the seafood on the market is believed to have been caught illegally. And it's also contributing to the fact that 50% of our fish stocks are now overexploited, and another 40% on top of that are being fished at max. And this is a huge problem for millions of people who depend on marine fish for their survival. Fishing has also been tied to other crimes at sea, including drug trafficking, human trafficking, and forced labor. But how do they get away with this? They get away with it because these vessels are essentially operating in the dark. Once they get across the horizon, you can't see what's happening, and they're not accountable. If we want our oceans to be part of our global food security in the future, and we want to start to address these problems, we need transparency. If we could shine a light on our oceans, we could start to address overfishing, illegal fishing, and human rights abuses. That's why Oceana teamed up with SkyTruth and Google. You've heard of them. And we created a thing called Global Fishing Watch. What we did was we used big data and cloud computing along with machine learning so that we could analyze the activities of large commercial fishing vessels on our oceans. And we looked at data that went all the way back to 2012 and came up to near real time, which means the data are about three days old and they're updated every day. We can do this because of data that are generated by the fishing vessels themselves. They use a system called the Automatic Identification System. I call it AIS. And it's actually designed so that vessels can see each other and avoid collisions, but satellites can pick up the transmissions and the positions of these vessels, and we can buy these data from satellite companies. And that allows us to create a map that shows us the locations of vessels. And if you imagine that each one of these yellow dots is a vessel, and you take just one of those vessels, and you look at its location over successive periods of time, you can actually create a vessel track like we did here. And so we built an algorithm that could analyze the track of vessels and make a distinction between when a vessel is transiting, which looks like a straight line, and when a vessel is fishing, which looks like a back-and-forth pattern that creates sort of a clump of dots. So then we ran all 60,000 of the, da the data from all 60,000 of the vessels that were transmitting AIS through that algorithm, and we came up with this map. This is Global Fishing Watch. You're looking at a heat map where every little blue dot on this map represents one instance of fishing, okay? And what you see immediately is that fishing is happening on all of our oceans all the time. And you can actually select a vessel, and you can see the track of that vessel, and if the data are in the system, you can also get identification information, the name of the vessel, its ID number, what flag it's flying. And we made this information available through Global Fishing Watch public. And so now, anyone in the world can actually see the activities of the global fishing fleet in near real time for free. It's like we shined a light on fishing 
in the world's oceans. So now, governments can ensure that the vessels that are fishing in their waters are actually authorized to be there, and then they can enforce against the ones that aren't. Seafood suppliers can find out where their fish were caught and how they were caught. Scientists and journalists can figure out how fishing is impacting the ocean's health, and nonprofit organizations and citizens like all of us can engage to identify suspicious vessels and report them to the authorities. Even fishermen can get involved. Fishermen can make themselves trackable so that they can show that they're following the rules, and then they can pressure the government to enforce against their other fishermen who aren't. It's like we crowdsourced global fisheries enforcement. So the kinds of things we can do to see how much fishing is happening, we can look at the footprints of national fleets. Here in yellow, you actually can see the footprint of the Chinese fleet fishing, not just near China, but all around the world. We can bring in the Japanese fleet in purple. Again, you can see they fish pretty much everywhere. And the Spanish fleet, which fishes all throughout the Atlantic, not just near Spain, and also in some parts of the Pacific. And there's nothing necessarily illegal about that, and nothing against these countries. But when you put it all together, you can really get an idea of the magnitude of fishing pressure that our oceans are facing. And you can also see in this map some little red circle areas. Those are marine protected areas. I'm going to zoom in on one of them. This is called the Phoenix Islands Protected Area. It's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. And the Phoenix Island Protected Area, this was actually ta uh, a shot from data in 2014. And at that time, this was a World Heritage Site. But as you can see, there's still fishing happening in this area during this World Heritage Site time period. It doesn't really stop fishing from happening. But the president of Kiribati, which is the country that governs this area, he said that as of January 1, 2015, he was going to make this a no-take marine protected area, which means there can be allowed no fishing in this area. Well, nobody really knew if it would work, if it would happen, so we decided to watch on Global Fishing Watch. So now I'm putting it in motion, and you're seeing what's happening in the end of December. And as we move into January, you can see that the fishing has, in fact, stopped. And so Global Fishing Watch was able to show the success, in this case, of a marine protected area. If the fishing hadn't stopped, we could have shown the failure of a marine protected area. But we kept watching this place, and we saw this one vessel that was fishing outside the marine protected area. And watch what it does. Yep, sitting here in Washington, D.C., you guys just caught a vessel fishing illegally in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So we made this information available to the government of Kiribati, and they were able to extract a $2 million fine from this fishing company. And that's a lot of money when you're Kiribati. That's about 1% of their gross domestic product. So another way that we get abuses at sea is through a process called transshipping. And what transshipping is, is when a fishing vessel meets up with a refrigerated cargo vessel, like this one shown here, and it unloads its catch onto the cargo vessel, it can refuel, and then it never has to go back into port. So you can see there would be a lot of benefits. These cargo vessels could be as big as if you would line up 10 buses end to end. That could be the length of one of these cargo vessels. That's how big they are. So this could have a lot of benefits to the fishing vessel, obviously. They can stay out longer. Some of these vessels stay out as long as a year at a time. They can also travel a lot further from port, as you saw in the previous slide. Some of these vessels are very far from where they come from. And third, it can prevent them from having the scrutiny they might get if they went into port. So why would they be concerned about that? Well, maybe they don't want to report their fishing limit, their fishing catch, because maybe it's over the limit. Maybe they're overfishing. Or maybe they're catching animals they're not supposed to be catching, fishing illegally. So they might not want to go into port and have that be observed. Or maybe they don't want to go into port because they don't want to let their workers off the boat. Human rights abuses are very common in this industry. And so transshipping can be a big problem. According to the State Department, there are a few places that are more conducive to exploitation than the high seas. Even children are trafficked in the fishing industry. In some cases, as many as 40% of the workers are under the age of 18. And the worst stat I'm going to tell you today, according to the United Nations, six out of 10 migrant fishing workers on Thai fishing vessels, six out of 10 have reported seeing a coworker killed. Transparency can shed light on these problems and start to solve them. So Global Fishing Watch published a map of every place where two vessels 
where a fishing vessel rendezvoused with a cargo vessel over the time period where we have data. And you can see how frequent this, this problem is. And here's what it looks like. There's two vessels fishing off the coast of Mozambique in this shot. And if I click, you'll see they start going southward in order to meet up with the refrigerated cargo vessel that's coming from the east is in the red line. They meet up, do their business, and then they go back to fishing. They didn't have to go back into port. They didn't have to necessarily report their catch. Now, we don't know whether they did or not, but this is a way they can avoid it. So Oceana published a, a map that showed where all the hot spots would be um, based on all of the times when these vessels rendezvoused, and that can allow governments to um, focus their enforcement in these areas. Another area where we are uh, concerned about abuses is with AIS on-off events. This is when they actually turn off their transmitters, um, and when they do that, we lose track of them. We're very concerned that takes away the transparency. But we can sometimes see it when this is happening. This is the Galapagos Islands. It's a restricted fishing area in the orange circle. And the vessel is going to come out from the coast, and watch what it does. Now you see it. Now you don't. Two weeks later, it becomes visible again and goes back into land. Now again, we don't know if they did anything illegal, but certainly the authorities could focus on that vessel for increased scrutiny when it comes back into port and see what it was up to. Oceana published a report where we showed that European vessels were fishing for several years off the coast of the Gambia in West Africa. And the Gambia didn't have a lot of fisheries enforcement going on at the time, because it takes a lot of resources. But they rely very heavily on seafood for food and for jobs. So after they saw our report, they decided to beef up their enforcement and also improve their fishery policies. And the last example I'm going to give you today is one about how governments can actually increase transparency. In the area of the Indonesia, Global Fishing Watch doesn't have a lot of data. There's not a lot of AIS transmissions that we can pick up. But the government of Indonesia has a thing called a vessel monitoring system. Many countries have this, where they collect similar data, but they don't make them public. It's private data. Well, Indonesia became the first government to publish their vessel monitoring system data, and they did it through Global Fishing Watch. And you can see the difference when you bring in the vessel monitoring system data from Indonesia. It totally fills out this area, and we can get a lot more transparency. We've now convinced Peru to do the same thing, and we're hoping other countries will follow. And this could really be a sea change in transparency if governments started to share their vessel monitoring system data. So as you can see, we have planet-scale problems. But transparency, driven by cloud computing and big data, can really help us to address some of the problems that face our oceans and the people who depend on them. Just like a spotlight can shed light on an issue, Global Fishing Watch can give us the power to see our ocean problems and to see a fuller picture. And we believe that with that transparency and together with all of you engaged citizens, that we can save the oceans and feed the world. Thank you.